Are you ready for battle? Our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, just looking for someone to devour. We need to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We have to put on the full armor of God. Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Put on the helmet of salvation with the breastplate of righteousness in place and your feet fitted with the gospel of peace. Take up the shield of faith against the enemy's arrows. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Remember, be constant in prayer and alert. And with the power of the spirit, you will win the battle. This morning, woke up to the news that uh, there, was, there was a group of Christian missionaries in Haiti who were over there to do uh, work in a very impoverished country, working on an orphanage, and of course, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, that 17 of them were kidnapped by a gang of thugs on a bus and are now being held ransom. I share that with you because I want us to begin our service just in a time of prayer. Those are the details that we know about the story. There's more to come. But I just think it's so important for us to pause right now and to remember, to acknowledge that our brothers and sisters who have shod their feet with the gospel of peace, who have gone out with the good news to be the hands and feet of Christ are now in a moment of peril. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, right now uh, we come to you, King Jesus, on behalf of our brothers and sisters, God grateful for their courage and their willingness to go and to to enter into an an impoverished nation and to, uh, to, to give of their time and their resources and to courageously tell others about you. Father, first and foremost, we pray for the glory of your name. We trust you. We we, we trust that we can come before your throne, and and we trust that that you, you will take their obedience and you will make much of the name of Jesus Christ. Hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Father, would you strengthen our brothers and sisters in their faith in the midst of this trial. I know that they have dear ones here back in the States and, and we identify with them, but, but we also pray for, for other missionaries all across the, the planet, those who are being persecuted, who are in the midst of this trials. And, and we pray, Father, that you would strengthen their faith, that you would remind them that though they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with them. You are peace. You are a shield about them. Father, in this situation, we do very specifically pray for their health and well-being, for them to be able to return safely. We ask for that, Father, from our limited perspective, for good things, for life and for vitality, for a resolution. We pray for our brothers and sisters, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been walking through the book of Ephesians. We've been constantly pressed from God's word, this reminder that you and I are in the midst of a spiritual battle that rages on around us at all times. Most of the time, we are so just immune to it. We, we, it does not process our senses because we, we go through just what, what we would call normal everyday life, just a certain rhythm that you and I have. But the scripture is quite clear that there is a spiritual battle that rages on all the time and eternal destinies are at stake. And most of the time, you and I are so muted in our desire and our passion towards God that we just kind of shrug it off. 
And so if we are to take God's word seriously, if we genuinely open God's word and hear him say, listen, there are principalities, dominions, and authorities that are waging war all the time that want you to stay muted. But hear me, God has rendered the heavens. God has come down. He has sent his son and he gives you, he offers you his armor so that you can battle, so that you can fight on behalf of your loved ones and yourself, your, your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors, so that you can enter into and you can stand firm. Take up the belt of truth, which is God's word that has been preserved for you. That you would make an ultimate decision that God's word is true. How God pictures the earth and the world is true and I will digest it and I will feed myself with it. Take up the breastplate of righteousness. Christ imputed righteousness given unto you. That gives you and I as Christians the ability to walk out in victory in newness of life. Shod your feet with the gospel of peace. That is our purpose, recognizing that you and I as messengers can herald the good news. We get to go out and shout, peace, peace. You can find peace with almighty God. We have such good news. And last week, as Daniel uh, did an incredible job of walking through the passage about the shield of faith, that in life, your life will be filled with trials and temptations that will come your way. And you have an enemy who will fire in fiery darts, flaming arrows in the midst of those trials, questions about, is God good? Did you do something wrong? Do you really have the faith in the midst of this? And you and I are called to hunker down behind the shield because God is our refuge. God is our tower and to hide in his goodness and in his promises. And now this morning, you need to know and understand that there is one particular fiery dart that the devil takes aim and fires more than any other. In fact, God gave you a special piece of armor because of this one particular fiery dart that every one of us deal with, that every one of us have to listen to the constant onslaught of the enemy, and that fiery dart is this. Are you really saved? Are you really saved? And this morning, the hope, the aim, is that we would put on the helmet of salvation and be able to rest in peace in a special Holy Spirit supernatural way in the salvation that is ours. Now listen to me. I know that every one of us wrestle and deal with that, but I am not just talking to those of you who might be newer Christians, you may be a Christian for 25 years. I am talking to you this morning because there is a tremendous fear that you and I have become so accustomed to, so just, just kind of laissez affair, blah, to the fact that you and I are saved. And the charge this morning is that if you and I put on that helmet of salvation, that if you and I drink deeply of the truth of God's word that you and I are saved, that is we're born again from eternity past, that our names have been written in the Lamb's book of life, that you and I will drink deeply from this well and be able to have a peace and a faith that overcomes every one of our circumstances and allows us to walk out in victory. So this, this is not, oh, oh yeah, let's, let's, let's check that off. I've settled my salvation uh, some time ago. Hear me for you, even mature believer, to drink deep from this well. Amen. Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10. 
Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God. Again, it is God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. By the way, who rages war against you constantly, whether you know it or not. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm. Therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming areas of the evil one in verse 17 and take the helmet of salvation. Brandy was a young mother of three who courageously went forward at the end of service to receive Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Those of us in her Sunday school class were a little surprised because she was already a baptized member of the church. But we wanted to greatly encourage her, of course. I mean, apparently the pastor's sermon about nailing down your salvation with absolute certainty really resonated with her. And who were we to even question what God was doing in her life? So we celebrated that next week when she was baptized and we threw a reception lunch. About three weeks later, Brandy courageously responded at invitation time. But to our surprise, the pastor again stood up and made the statement that she wanted to nail down her salvation. She wanted to make sure with assurance that she was saved. And so a couple weeks later, she was baptized again. After the third pattern of this, even though I was just a layman in that church, I had to pull Brandy aside and just have a conversation with her. As a pastor, this conversation is probably one that I've had more times than I can count. And it typically goes something like this. The person is filled with fear, confusion, anxiety as they quiver. How can I know that I'm saved. I mean, I want to be saved, but I feel so far away from Jesus. There are times where I feel close to him, but, but I feel like I've walked away. One encounter with a young seven-year-old named Byron, I remember looking at him, asking him, hey, son, have you ever placed your faith in Jesus Christ? To which he, his lip began to quiver, his eyes filled up with tears. He looked at me and he said, I have, but I can't stop sinning. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Listen to me, every single one of us have wrestled with that very question. How can I know that I'm saved? I remember in my own life that God had grabbed a hold of me uh, in college and I, I had this period of incredible growth with the Holy Spirit where, where, where I genuinely felt him, him uh, Growing me like never before, leaps and bounds, only to come to a crisis of faith just three months later where I couldn't feel him anymore. I began to, to be filled with all sorts of doubts and just ask the questions, uh, did, did I miss something? Do, do I need to receive the, the, the Spirit a second time to be filled? H have, I, have I wandered away from the faith? Where is he? Friend, my aim is to help you today to have confidence so that you can know that you are saved. I mean, truthfully, I don't 
plan to help you, Jesus does. And he offers you his helmet of salvation so that you can know, so that you can have confidence. That's the piece of armor that he is offering you. And hear me, Satan will attack you and your children with this question over and over and over again until you get it settled. Think for a moment about a soldier and his helmet. You see, the head is the most vital, sensitive part of the body. Mind, eyes, ears, all of the cognitive faculty. The Roman soldier's helmet was made of bronze with cheek plates that would come down so that only the eyes and the mouth are exposed. When the helmet is on, you see there's a calmness that comes over you. You kind of feel invincible. But without it, you feel so vulnerable, almost naked, just completely exposed and fraught with fear. That is why here in Ephesians 6 and previously in Isaiah 59, the helmet is referred to as the helmet of salvation. Because without assurance of salvation, a believer is overcome with fear. Anxiety, constantly asking the question, am I in the family of God? Did I leave the family? Have I out sinned being in the family? You see, there is scarcely a wound like the uncertainty of not being accepted by a parent. Jordan was a young teenager who never knew his father and his mother was a drug addict. And so he lived with his aunt. This kid had every reason under the sun to turn out not like you would uh, uh, to turn out like an absolute delinquent. And yet, by God's grace and mercy, the Lord had his hand upon him and he was in my church and constantly there. There was so much hope with him. But his mom would go through these cycles where where she would go through rehab, she would get clean and she would return home and for a period of time Jordan would would leave living with his aunt and and go back to live with his mom only to have weeks if not months later she would vanish and turn back to drugs and addiction What do you say to a young man who sits in your office with tears streaming down his face? And he says, why doesn't she love me more than than getting high? There is scarcely a wound as deep as rejection from a parent. Or Abby whose father had left her and her mother early on. They had a distance relationship, but but one summer she was supposed to go and she was supposed to spend six weeks with her father over that summer. It was very obvious to, to me as her youth pastor that she was clinging to boys out of a desperate hole in her heart. She was so filled with hope this summer that things were going to work out, that they were going to connect, that she was going to be able to heal so many of these wounds. I, as our youth pastor, uh, I, I mean, I prayed to that end, but only to end up with her too in my office weeping because he had flaked out on her again. I share those stories with you because the same thing occurs spiritually in your and my life when we do not know and have the assurance of salvation. Does God accept me? Have I done enough? 
Have I out sinned his grace? Why can't I feel his presence? Has he abandoned me? You do realize that every other religion in the entire world keeps man enslaved to fear, never being able to ask the question, am I good enough to earn acceptance with the holy God of the universe? In fact, Muslims think that Christians are arrogant to think that they can know that they have salvation, that they can know God personally. And I'm sure you're aware that there are even Christian denominations that think that you can lose your salvation. I'm here this morning to tell you the Bible tells you differently. The Bible tells you that you can know, that you can have an assurance. And that believer, God wants this to be a settled issue in your life so that you are not tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of trial that comes upon you in life. But rather, Jesus is offering you his helmet of salvation, offering that you would put it on. First John chapter 5, verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Jesus wants to give you his helmet so that all the noise, all the, all the noise and doubt of anxiousness and fear, it, it, be, it becomes just, just noise-canceling headphones that come on and you are able to just have peace that resides upon you. I think when I was a a young man uh, playing sports growing up, there was a period of time where I was a catcher and my father loved baseball. He was always my coach and he really wanted to convince me that uh, the gear protects you. The catcher's gear protects you and that you won't get hurt. So now picture me there on a hot summer afternoon filled with catcher's gear, standing up against the backstop. I've got all my gear on. I've got my helmet on. And here's my father pegging baseballs at me as they bounce off the helmet so that I realize it doesn't hurt. Well, after a couple hits, initially you're filled with a lot of fear, but then a couple bounce off and you say, hey, wait a second, this doesn't hurt. That is what Jesus is offering you this morning, his helmet of salvation. All right, so let's get right to it. Let's ask the question. All right, pastor, how can I know that I'm saved? Here you go, number one. Have you placed your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and not your own good works. Listen to me. God loves you. God created you to have a relationship with him, to know him. That's the good news, that God made you in his image to know him. But the bad news is that you have rebelled against your father God is holy, and you have declared that you are king. The Bible says that in God's holiness, there is a book in heaven that has your name written on it. And written inside of that book is every sin you've ever committed. And your sinfulness separates you from a holy God. Every thought, everything you've ever said, everything you've ever done is in your book that is reserved in heaven. And the Bible says that at the end of time, your book will be opened and the charges will be read for all to hear. Everything done in secret will be brought into light. There will be a public forum, a public uh, uh, court session where your charges will be read. And the Bible is very clear that in that that moment your mouth will be shut you will have no rebuttal you will have no reply you will know and realize in that moment that God is holy that God is perfect and you have nothing to say I know in every other area of your life you've been filled with these excuses about how it was someone else's fault or why you did what you did or why you shouldn't have done what you uh, should have done 
But in that moment, the Bible says your mouth will be shut. That no one will be justified by the works of the law on their own. That everyone has sinned. That no one seeks after God. It's the bad news. That in yourself, in your own condition, you are separated from God. You are spiritually dead. And you will spend eternity away from God in a place called hell. But there is good news. And the good news is that God sent his son born of a virgin, entered into our mess, into our depravity, that God sent his son who lived his entire life to perfection. And here is Jesus's book filled with absolute perfection. Not once did he ever sin. But on top of that, his book is filled with righteous deeds because the scripture says he only spoke what God wanted him to speak. He only did whatever the father wanted him to do. How incredible is that? But at the end of Jesus's life, although he clearly earned and deserves heaven, at the end of Jesus's life, the Bible says, according to God's plan, that he became your sin. That our sin was placed upon him. That God the Father poured out his wrath upon his son. That his son became all of your shame. All of the guilt. Everything that you deserve. That it was placed upon the son. And the wrath of, of God poured out upon the son. So that in return he could exchange and he could give you his righteousness. That you could make an exchange That Jesus Christ's perfection, an entire life lived to perfection, could be credited towards your account. And that you could switch books. This is what it means to be saved. That you have switched accounts with Jesus Christ. That you are no longer trusting in your own works, in your own finished goodness. But rather you are trusting that Jesus has done it all for you. I stand before you not as a pastor, but as a fellow sinner of one who 25 years ago placed my faith in Jesus Christ, that as a free gift, he will switch accounts with you. If you just ask, all you have to do is ask, but there is one condition. See this crown I'm wearing upon my head? It has to go to him. That he will switch. He will exchange with you. He will forgive you. Give you all of his righteousness. Credited to your account. Take your sin. If you're willing to bow and make him king. I ask you, dear friend. Have you ever placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you right now know that your salvation is established, that is eternal, that is secure, because Jesus plus nothing has covered your sin. If that is you, then you're saved. Then you're saved. Then he has done it. Notice I didn't ask how you feel this morning. Because you're going to have some messed up days. Okay? And you're going to walk in disobedience. And you're going to doubt. Are you trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross? When my oldest son was five, he got saved. As parents, we waited a little while. When he turned six, he got baptized. When When he turned seven, he began to have some doubt and confusion in his life. Couldn't sleep at night was constantly asking, Daddy, how do I know that I'm saved? How do I know that I'm saved? So one day I took him to Burger King. Don't judge me. (laughs) We're sitting there at Burger King. We began to have a conversation. He just kept asking over and over, how do I know that I'm saved? How do I know that I'm saved? I said, look, man, if if you want to nail this down right now, you can ask him right now. You can know, all right? If if you don't remember when you were were five, if if you weren't ready, you can know right now. If you want to be saved, you can be saved. So we prayed right there. And he asked Jesus to be his Lord and Savior. And then three minutes later, he looks at me and he says, how can I know I'm saved? By God's grace, he gave me an illustration right there in that moment. And I said to him, listen, son. 
Let's say early in the morning, daddy calls you, he's at work, and he says, I have a present for you. You know that football you've been wanting? I went to the store and I bought it, and when I get home, I'm gonna give you that gift of that football and we're gonna play catch. I said, throughout the middle of the day, you can worry all day. How do I know he's going to bring it? How do I know he's going to bring it? How do I know he's going to bring it? And he stopped me mid-illustration. He looked at me and he said, I know you'll bring it. I can trust you. I said, that's exactly right. You can trust your heavenly father. Listen, your heavenly father is satisfied in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his son. He is fully satisfied in Jesus And you can trust that truth so that you can rest and have a confidence and assurance. Put on his helmet of salvation. Listen, if you need that settled, you can do it right now. Settle it once and for all. Are you trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ? You say, all right, yes, pastor, but, but afterwards, how, how do I look back? How can I know? The Bible does talk about being able to look back in our lives after periods of time, being able to look back and have a confident assurance. I have to be overly simplistic here, okay? We could do entire series. I will do an entire series on assurance of salvation, but I want to give you handles this morning and I want to give you two quick assurances that you can know that you are saved, okay? That you can look back. The first one, do you love him? Do you love him? The story I shared with you earlier in college when I was filled with tremendous amount of doubt, gone through a season where I couldn't feel the closeness of God. I happened by God's grace to open a devotional and and for some reason it asked the question, do you love him? And suddenly those words jumped off the page because here's the deal. I knew that my life was filled with sin. I knew that I had wrestlings and trials in my life that were swirling around That experientially, kind of day by day, moment by moment, I would feel distant from him. And yet when that question was asked, do you love him? I knew deep down, deep within, that I loved God. And at that moment, I realized that the Holy Spirit had planted that inside of me. And I knew I was a child of God. Because I loved him. Now, just in case you think I'm making this up, that this is what the Bible says... Listen to Romans 8, 15, and 16. You need to check with me. Make sure I'm just not giving you fanciful ideas. Listen to this. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Okay? So I don't mean, I mean to press you, this is a deep spiritual truth. I don't mean that you're not going to have days of doubt and you're not going to have trials where you have this initial wave of emotions where I don't feel comfortable right now and I have all that stuff. The question is, is do you love him? Because the spirit inside of you will testify that you love him and that you're his. Secondly, Do you see conviction in your life over sin? Okay? Does the Spirit convict you? Give it enough time. As you walk through trials and temptations and the hills and valleys of life, you will inevitably mess up, make mistakes. And the question is, is the Holy Spirit inside of you grieving because you've separated yourself? Your sin separates you from God. Does that grieve the Spirit inside of you? Every father disciplines his son or daughter. You should be able to see the disciplined hand of God in your life. The Bible gives many warnings. If you never see that disciplined hand, watch out. 
You could not be a child, but if you can look back, if you can see the disciplined hand of God, you are called to have assurance. God loves me enough to rein me in. Those two things. All right, so what do I want you to take away this morning? What does it mean for you to put on the helmet of salvation? Each day, as a believer, this this piece of armor that's been given, this very specific one, the helmet of salvation. Hear me, when you and I are able to put it on, we rest and we have a peace. The noise gets canceled. There's a calmness in our soul that overcomes our circumstances. Listen to how he unfolds this in 1 John chapter 5. He says, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Then we'll listen to what he says next. This is the confidence which, which we have before him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request upon uh, which we have asked from him. In other words, for you and I to daily put on the helmet of salvation, it means you enter your prayer closet, you're able to say, you know what, I know I'm a child of God. I know I'm his son. I know I'm his daughter. And I am able to have confident access to him. Not because of how I feel that day, but because of Jesus Christ, the finished work on the cross. And so what happens is you know who you are. And you put that salvation on. Now hear me. When you first came to salvation, you just thought you were getting Forgiveness for your sin and punching your ticket to heaven. Okay? That's all you wanted. That's all you could think about. And that's good. But if you put on the helmet of salvation daily, daily, you will realize that that God intends so much more to unfold in your heart. It's... If you, if you comb through the book of Ephesians and you ask the question, what is salvation in the book of Ephesians? He has, he has this list that's this long. It's why he actually prays that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened, that you would be able to see all that is yours. It, it, it's what he does throughout the entirety of the letter, that God knew you, that he chose you before the foundation of the world, that you are adopted, that he has redeemed you, that he sealed you by the Holy Spirit, that he gives you the power to put on the Holy Spirit and walk out in newness of life. There is so much that God intends for to be unfolded in your life, far beyond just I'm forgiven and I get to go to heaven. And so if you put on the the helmet of salvation, the quietness, the peace overcomes you, and then you begin to ask your heavenly Father, teach me. Teach me all that you intend for me to have because I have a leaky bucket. I've, I've been walking with the Lord for 25 years and, and this morning I was just sitting there convicted. I think I believe about this much, which by the way is up from about this much, but I believe about this much. God, would you unfold all that you have for me that I am yours, that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life, that I can know with absolute confidence and I'm saved. And I'm saved. On the evening of September 15th, 1999, just before 7 p.m., a crazed gunman entered Wedgwood Baptist Church in Fort Worth and opened fire, killing seven and wounding seven more. Youth happened to be there that evening at a saw you at the pole prayer rally. 
of which he entered the building, the gunman fired over 100 rounds from two different handguns, exploded a homemade pipe bomb in the worship center where the youth were at their rally. After 10 minutes of his rampage, the gunman moved towards the back of the sanctuary where he encountered a 19-year-old young man named Jeremy. As he approached Jeremy, he lifted up and pointed his gun and an interaction happened back and forth. It's difficult to tell the exact details of that interaction, but the gist of it went with Jeremy saying, you don't have to do this. The gunman yelling lots of cuss words and explicitives, certainly demonic influence over that situation, to which Jeremy stood up and said, I know where I'm going. I know who I am. I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ. In response to that conversation, the gunman sat down on the back row and took his own life. When I pause to think about that situation and the the crossroads and just the, the moment of crisis in life, I'm overwhelmed by Jeremy's courage to be able to stand up and say, I know who I am. I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. I don't mean to be heavy handed. It's almost assuredly you will not face a gunman and have to ask the question, who are you? But the reality is, is death is certain to all of us. It is certain. And your enemy constantly shoots flaming arrows and wants you to be filled with so much fear, anxiety, and discouragement. And Jesus is offering you his helmet so that you can stand up and say, I know who I am. I'm a Christian. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we have gathered around your word all across this room. Father, if there is any who does not know you, would they not have peace? Would they not have assurance? But instead, right now, in their heart of heart, would they cry out to you for salvation? Please, God, in Jesus' name, give them faith to cry out for salvation. And for those of us that know you, would you teach us to put on your helmet of salvation and to walk with assurance and a confidence in the midst of trials and difficulty of life against that one flaming arrow to know that we know that we know that we are yours. And to walk in your victory. To trust you, Jesus. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.